My name is Monk Rowe, and I'm very, very pleased to have Mr. Phil Wilson with me today, trombonist, jazz educator, composer, and arranger. Thanks for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Monk. <laughs> Thank you for asking me. I want to start out with a, a quote from you in, in a document that I saw, and it you were talking about Berkeley in your career, and it said... I'm thankful to the Berkeley family for the opportunity I've had to earn a living doing what I should be doing for 40 years. So I'm wondering if you can cast your memory way back. Hmm. Did you have a time when you were young that you decided what you should be doing? When did you feel that you could, could and should be making a living in music? When did you think I could get away with it, I think is what you're saying. Um, it goes really way back. Um, um, if, if we were to... I was born in a uh, dormitory that looked more like a mansion for the Belmont Hill School in Belmont, Massachusetts. And uh, there was a piano in the kind of a garden room at the one end of the building which had an old upright piano and everybody was out of the house because again uh, there's no musicians in my family here. we were busy trying to make the belmont hill school come alive back in those days that school had 152 students and 24 graduated doing grades 7 through 12 and uh, my dad married the headmaster's daughter who <laughs> uh, had three beautiful uh, young ladies and then I was an afterthought really and coming of another seven years later so uh, they were really busy trying to make the school work in those days and not unlike the the basic group that was in the original Berkeley School of Music later on. That's for my, because the, the, the same idea of building and trying to make it work and still pay for salaries of the teachers is a whole nother thing, as you well know. So, uh, um, the, uh, <laughs> that, that grand, that um, upright piano in the back, if everybody was out of the house, I would get into that room and start screwing around, you know. And pretty soon, I started playing hymns that I heard in the church, which was uh, a, a, in Boston. The, the family went down every Sunday, unless I stayed home to cook with my father, which was a wonderful thing. So uh, <laughs> I knew that what I was playing, you know, triads, uh, was good. There's that theophany that goes up your back, you know, when something really thrills you, it, it can be anything. But when when something's right, I was four years old at the time, I, if not younger, because... Did, did you have any idea if you were playing the hymns, discovering them in the key that they were being, that you heard them in. No, I was only playing on the white keys. White keys, right. A minor was a bitch one, big one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I still so, just play on the white keys. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, after a while, um, I started realizing that, hey, I, I don't have to keep playing the same stuff. I, can, I started doing uh, my own stuff. And that same, every time something really happened, you know, that really was a, th a thrill, that thing would go up my back and I said, you know, that is, that's good. And there's nobody in the, in the building except for one person on the third floor of this building I, we call where I was from ages zero to five. There was one. Eight boys were living in the eighth floor, a day, day students from Monday to Friday. And they had a faculty member who loved jazz. 
particularly Louis Armstrong's Heart Five, and uh, you know Sidney Bechet and that whole thing. And uh, so uh, I must have heard some of that because later on I began to, uh, especially when I heard Louis Armstrong at Symphony Hall with Jack T. Garton and Rob Barney Bagard and uh, that beautiful band he had played that album with, which I managed to get a hold of a copy. And uh, that made, Louis was a huge influence. There was also another thing going on in Belmont uh, with my mother and father working quite hard trying to keep the, my three sisters alive and well. They are also trying to keep that school working. So I was really largely raised by three uh, women of color, Willie Sims, who was in our family for almost 40 years, was looking after my grandmother, who had to be in bed every night at 7 o'clock, period, with a heart ailment, you know. So uh, Willie Sims really took care of. Uh, my grandmother. But during the day, my parents were not around. They, my sisters were at school somewhere. And uh, so I really had my, I was on my own, really. And these three wonderful women, over a period of five years, of starting at, at, at age zero, like, you know, were around me, giving it lots of love. And uh, I love those women. And it never occurred to me, even later in life, until I grew up, you know, I was pretty uh, naive. I, uh, the, the color the, that's uh, colored people of, of different skin colors and things like that, that ha was happening to me from the big beginning of my life. And I never thought anything of it. There was, what reason is there? Did, do you recall? So, uh, do you recall the first time our significant time when you witnessed um, segregation or racial yeah. attitudes that, that were mysterious to you? Uh, I mean, yes, but only in those days, no. I, I, was, I was really colorblind. But then when I first went with, with the Dorsey band, which was, I, this is a hell of a lot later, this would be when I was 20, I um, went with the Dorsey band and I was going to meet him in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I took the, the, the milk plane around to every milk stop around the country to get to Shreveport. It was, oh my God. And I, I, I'd never flown before. And I wasn't ready for it, believe me. I said, no, this is not what I want to, <laughs> want to be doing, you know. But I got out in Shreveport. It's the first time uh, you had segregated water, se separated bathrooms, separated restaurants. Although I've never, ever seen that. And uh, we toured the rest of the summer around the South. Good Lord, we, back there, the Dorsey Band was still uh, fully booked because uh, ballrooms in the country were still, they still existed, if I say. They, uh, so, uh, and the Dorseys, you got to remember, in 1940, the Dorsey name was as big as Elvis Presley in terms of, you know, the lasting, it, it had legs, they had legs, you know. Yeah. So, um, um, we had, we, every night we played a, a dance somewhere, and, and of course, both Tommy and Jimmy at that point had died. Uh, Jimmy was uh, a month before I joined the band. He died of smoking, you know, cancer. Jamie gave us all be happy about that. The, uh, um, Tommy died 18 months before of, um, of throwing up in his sleep. Yes. And take two second on and all that sort of stuff. So uh, the the we were billed as the Jimmy Dorsey band, but still Lee, Lee Castaldo 
was the leader at the time, and Lee Lee was uh, a, a favorite of the Dorseys, both of them, because Tommy loved his playing, and so did Jimmy, for that matter. But uh, the, Tommy had a small band within the band called the Clam Bite Seven, and he loved to have get, uh, uh, Lee playing the lead part. But the problem is he couldn't put it put him in the section because he couldn't read. And so he sent him to take lessons with his father, who taught both Jimmy and Tommy. And so Lee became like a third Dorsey brother for about a year or so until he could read adequately so he could read uh, Tommy's book. And uh, uh, later on, after Tommy and Jimmy died and I joined the band, I actually uh, met uh, the mother. Uh, an amazing amazingly strong woman my god well, did, the, did the anticipation of joining a well-known big band equal the experience when you you, you got with the band and you, you went on the road uh, on a bus every day did it get to be um the same did it get to be this realization that this life is not necessarily what I thought it would be. No, I don't think so. Um, it was pretty much what I expected it to be. <laughs> but uh, after a while, you start listening to some of the cadenzas I was playing in the Woody's band where give me a simple life. <laughs> Began to appear an awful lot. <laughs> I oh, that's funny. <laughs> it is indeed. Yes. <laughs> and what you, what you know, I, you know the tape by any chance of uh, that I did of Lonesome Old Town that was broadcast from England uh, with Woody's band. I, I don't think I've heard that. To, to the uh, the uh, cadenza, you're going to hear a nice version of "Give Me the Simple Life." <laughs> and what did your parents think of uh, our son Phil, the big band trombonist? I got—I was the black sheep of the family for a while. Are you kidding? The uh, um, my family was a loving family. God love them. I know they're going to probably see this, and I love you all forever, and you know it. But uh, at that time, you got to remember that uh, everybody is. From the Ivy League, Dad uh, graduated from Harvard and uh, married the headmaster's daughter at Belmont Hill, which today is a thriving school, just like Berkeley is a thriving school. But of course, uh, that's two different, that's two different countries, two children. But uh, the um, um, Nothing, man. I'm sorry. I just get. Well, uh, I, I'm wondering if what uh, what I'll call the jazz life, the the day to day, the night to night. Oh man! Uh, yeah, right. was yeah. was it a culture shock to go from your upbringing into into the the jazz life? Yes, of course. It, uh, huge, but on the other hand. There weren't many other things I really felt I was much good at, you know. Music has always been part of my life. Even I've got a, a mild case of dyslexia. I'm not a not a fast reader. I'm not one of these guys who can walk in and do about four or five uh, commercials and cash in on the royalties, you know. I'd love to be. I did do some of that, and I I actually did play also. I was first called in Boston for 38 years doing the shows. But while everybody else is uh, uh, playing the poker, waiting for the show to begin, I was reading up there. I was going through the music just to be look out for what I needed to look out for. And I'd take the book home. And so uh, I really took care of business for that stuff. But um, I'm also. 
when you when you say I'm a I'm a, I'm a poor reader, that's not really the truth. I'm a damn good reader. As a matter of fact, I'm just painfully slow. Okay. Period. <laughs> you know, I do have those those moments that are pretty much uh, legendary. Of I do occasionally ch change a, 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 a digit around and. You know the annoying things that uh, do come along with dyslexia, and of course now I'm 86 years old and I've got a menu of diseases going on in this old body of mine. So uh, <laughs> you know it seems very unimportant. <laughs> I was reading um, Woody Herman Chronicle of the Herds book, and there was an interesting anecdote from you talking about in two days, one day you're playing for Governor Faubus of Arkansas, hmm. the next night you're playing in Harlem. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. <laughs> We're going down, and, um, wasn't that Governor Faubus? We yes, were... Alabama. Alabama. Well, we start playing in the beginning, people just coming into the room, right? Well, well, just one of those things. It sounds like a general business man, except it was written by Ralph Burns. <laughs> but we're getting away with it. Only everything's in two, right? And the second uh, set goes, comes by, and we're still in two. We take a break. We come back. We're in two. They're by now, these old politicians and whatever they are, um, are getting a little juiced and they're, they're feeling no pain. Then we go to four. <laughs> now, when we went to Harlem two days later, we just started right out in four. We didn't mess around. <laughs> mess around. I, I I'd like to ask you, um, because some people who might watch this may not know what, what are you talking about in two and in four? And do you have memories of now, now I'm thinking of you at Berkeley and starting off the year and you've got the dues band or a big band and explaining the difference in two or in four to the bassist and the drummer. How did you do that? By playing it, I actually had a small set of drums back when I was 12 years old that somebody left in the dormitory up at Phillips Exeter where we moved to after um, at age six. And this would be six through 18. Dad was um, running the freshman dorm. That means I had 74 boys living with me in this Dunbar Hall. And they were every it was like living in a holiday inn with a with a, <laughs> with a dining room to seat 250 people every morning at 7, every noon around 12.30, and every night around 6. And then it was right next to our living room, of course. We, we had adjourned um, uh, win, uh, walls, so <laughs> that, that make, doesn't make for a nice, cozy living room anyways. Um, the uh, at, at Exeter, the uh, um, no, I'm not going to be able to finish that story. Well, you were talking about. Uh, I was wondering how you taught the bassist and the drummer the two difference. to four, two to four, yeah, two to four, right? I had a uh, set of drums. I used to play them when I was 12 years old to Buddy Rich doing Well, Get It and Tommy Dorsey's band, things like that. And um, I, of course, it's a, it was a, you know, Exeter's a rich boys' school, come on. And uh, boys leave stuff behind. And I'm a faculty brat, right? At, for Phillips Exeter. I mean, you know, I'm growing up and running around and still my, um, running my own show, basically. 
and uh, I, uh, the boy left in the basement of the dam phase. Very kind of, it was a full set of drums, but it was not what we would think of playing today's rock band. It was just a bass drum and a hi-hat. And that's the, so actually, I got to be a pretty good drummer to be able to figure out time feels, time to, so if somebody was trying to down, go down, go down, but to bump it, boom, go down, go down, but to go down, boom, go down, but down. Well, there's nice too, but if you want to happen to move just a little bit faster than that, you can go down, 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 down. There's four, down, go 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 You know what I mean? Yes. You you can just kind of give a little demonstration of what two feels like and four uh, as against four in that manner. You could also uh, go into marching bands and things like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I don't care for that so much. Okay. You know, at oh, one I'm point sorry. at Phillips Exeter, I ran my first big band at the age of uh, oh God, I don't know, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. A 72 piece the, uh, marching band for the football game, the Phillips Exeter. Da -da. Wow. And, uh, um, I used to try to do uh, Glenn Miller's from well, uh, St. Louis Blues Saint Louis March. St. Louis Blues March, yes. I used to love uh, that. Yeah. And uh, I finally, after about three years, I got them so they could play it so you'd recognize the melody. <laughs> <laughs> when I think, when I think of um, you, you young men on the, on the bus, I guess with with there's some stories about Woody Herman and the you know the bus trips. Yeah. What did you do on the bus to pass the time? This well before people could you know stare at their phones all day, or well oh. before uh, having a disc player. How did you pass the time? Very, very comfortably in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, 18, 19, 20. I went out with the Dorseys at 20. And basically, I stayed on the road until I left Woody's van in 67. Can't be that long. I must be exaggerating. But still, we're, we're talking uh, the Dorsey Band, the Al Boletto's group for half a year going into the Army, the Navy, uh, the NORAD Band, North American Air Defense Command. And that was in that, that that's where I learned all my uh, um, tech, what technica, technique I know about uh, how to, to microphone, et cetera, et cetera. I learned my own, how to get my own sound out of it. I, I recorded all these records for uh, uh, NORAD for two years out in Hollywood. We were in the, uh, recorded two months of the year for two years straight. And I got to uh, work on my arranging uh, and composition uh, and having it played on a daily basis. I learned to uh, solo over and write my own charts, things like that. They were not world beaters, but they sure did help me learn how my craft. Let me ask you some more about that. Um, I I may be a bit like you with with arranging, and I think so. I, yeah, I, I never had books. Um, I mostly absorbed what I was hearing from big bands, and and me too. Tried to make it, you know, I would sit at the piano and say, well, if the saxes are doing this, then <laughs> maybe the trombones could do that and trial and error. Can I, I got to tell you, this is a true story now. When we were in, in Exeter, again, in this big dorm that my dad was, I, my room was on the third floor of our apartment and the piano was on the first floor. And I'm listening to Jazz at the Philharmonic volume nine or ten and in it Hank Jones is playing the piano and Bill Harris 
is playing the trombone and Dizzy, you know, and all it's a ten inch, you know. And in the middle of I think it was Bill Harris's solo, Hank Jones hits a D over C seven. In other words, the the upper stru- the upper structure triad, right? And I said, Oh man. I mean, he hits it about like boom, and then moves on. You know, the bridge of Perdido, I think it was. You know, <laughs> right? Yes. And uh, I, I, oh, I love the sound of that chord. I wanted to know what that chord was, so I ran down two flights of stairs to the piano and started. You know, I wish I had a piano here to demonstrate because it was funny. No, 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 no. So I run up two flights of stairs. Put it on and a uh, seventy-eight. You know, it was a set, not a, not a. No, that was a that was an LP, ten inch. And so finally, and I, this went on for over two weeks, up and down. I'm going to find that mother, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I finally. Oh no! I I took a red pencil, and when it hit. On the, the yeah on the on the uh, LP the uh, C seven uh, up eleven sharp eleven I marked it with red you know so I could just drop the needle on it <laughs> I did get it after two weeks I told Hank Jones that years later when he was at some festival he got a good laugh out of it <laughs> that is some paying of dues right there. No kidding. <laughs> Is that, um, I always remember the feeling, usually good, sometimes not, when you toil over things and you're writing by pencil and yeah. see if you have to copy your own parts and, and then you finally get to hear it. Yeah. That I, I wonder if you got that uh, that feeling up your back. You better believe it. I do all the time. Yep. I'm getting to be one hell of a piano player now because, you know, later in life, at 2014, I came down with lymphoma, um, B cell cancer, and the Hodgkin's, non Hodgkin's disease. And uh, that pretty much, it was the glands right here. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, that really took the end of my trombone career because the radiation part of those chemotherapy and then I developed um, pneumonia for nine painful days and then I had a full month of radiation right in here five days a week noon on the night wow. and the residue from the uh, radioaction from from trying to get the cancer spilled over to the base of the tongue. And boy, that was the end of my fast tonguing at all, being able to get around the horn. Yeah. Uh, nobody wanted to hear me play, you know. What was it like, um, going back to Woody Herman for, for a moment, what was it like to follow Bill Harris and get... Um, play tunes that featured him and now oh, they feature you i love bill harris and i was hugely influenced by him when i was in high school i had a had the um, a band at phillips exeter believe it or not playing the <laughs> um, playing all the charts i wanted to play and i wrote out uh, bump, 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 everywhere uh, which was a big uh, feature for Bill Harris, 1946, Carnegie Hall for the concert. Bum, 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 bum. And beautiful ending and all that sort of thing. He had a, he had a, a, a sound that was as lush as Bill Harris, Bill uh, Harris, Bill um, Watrous years later. But he didn't, he had, he wasn't as uh, obviously the same level of, 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 of playing the horn. He was more a seat of his pants. So was Bill, actually, but he had had a little more experience. Yeah, he had a bigger seat. <laughs> right. right. 
<laughs> but Bill uh, Bijou was the one uh, that kept, Wardy kept having me play. And I really didn't care for, for doing that. I, I, listen, I was, Woody Herman was perhaps one of the biggest influences in my life as a musician and as a person. He was uh, special. Yeah. 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 He'd, he'd shoot it. I didn't like playing uh, Bijou because it was Bill Harris's piece, and I had Lonesome Old Town, you know. So I, I, I didn't need to do that, and I, I didn't mean to dishonor, in a sense, Bill Harris. And then came a surprise. Um, there's a, L, a big 10 inch, a 12 inch LP, Woody's Goodies. When uh, Columbia Records took Woody Herman's band, that one we were with, we should talk about that a little bit more. This is some interesting story there. When Woody uh, changed record labels from the Phillips to uh, Columbia, in 1945, we did one, I did one uh, for Columbia with him, my kind of Broadway. It was, boy, the band was cooking. It was really, that was about the peak of the band. But um, except Joe, Jake had left, Jake Hanna. Jake Hanna. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ronnie Zito came in, took his place. He did a great job, but he was not a Jake Hanna. You know, it, 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 he he learned actually. We did a Ed Sullivan show with him, playing uh, my kind of my favorite, my favorite. Bo do do da bo do bo do do da da bo do do da. My, my favorite, favorite things. things. Yeah, we we did that in uh, on the uh, live on the uh, Ed Sullivan show. And they set us up in a straight line about nine to ten feet above Nat Pierce piano, Ronnie Zito drum, um, drums, and Charlie the Arm bass, who always played acoustic without an amp. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> And it worked, you know. <laughs> I was I was anticipating a train wreck, actually. It wasn't. Haven't you ever seen that video? I guess you I ought, You ought to check it out because, I mean, Chase and the, the five trumpets, three trombones, you know, four saxophones up there. And they, somebody had the smart idea of wouldn't it be fun to to match the early days of Woody Herman's um, uh, 62 band when we played the Metropole in New York, uh, corner of 7th and Broadway, I think it was, something like that. 48th Street, it was 48th, it was corner of 48th and, and uh, Broadway. And uh, every night, this is what put us on the map, because they had a picture, they had a picture made up of us on put it and put it on the top of a billboard issue on the front page because it was uh, unheard of. It was, the bar was seventy five feet long. People had open door, open door, wide open. I mean, really wide. You could park a car in the door, and people coming by uh, the uh, the place could just walk in. And walk out. I mean, it was always open, right in the corner of Broadway and 48th. So you know, it was always packed. And the band, the bar went 48, 75 feet up. Up here is the band, the saxophone close to the door. Then we run into Nat Pierce's piano, and this is right behind the bar, and right. At this point, five, four saxophones, and then we've got to have a piano, and you couldn't put, it didn't fit on the, just half the bar, so it had to cover the full bar. 
So all the bartenders, if they wanted to go one end to the other, had to bow their head way, way down. It was, you know, unbelievable. But that was that was the stage also. That was where Woody could, could do his act and and uh, Charlie the Arm. Charlie the Arm actually was, it was <laughs> four saxophones, Charlie the Arm. And then this thing over the bar, right, with the drums and the, and the piano and Woody. And then five trumpets over here and the three trombones way down there. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and I was, uh, you know, I was a regular feature. I was blessed with that. And every time I had to play a solo, I had to go walk up in front of five trumpets to get to the microphone. It was you know? a very narrow stage, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. And I, uh, the, the gentleman who started this whole project, the Hamilton graduate, talked about going there. Yeah. The band would be in a straight line. And boy, you have to listen really hard and, uh, Listen in a different fashion. Yeah, you better know it. It was a different fashion. And the opposite side of the room, it was um, a, a long room, not terribly wide. Okay, So the far opposite the stage over there was a wall, a ceiling to floor mirror so that we could watch Jake Hanner's Hi hat. You know what I mean? I do. And that would keep it together. And that's exactly what we did. And during the third set, and the third set would usually go on around 2 30 in the morning. <laughs> we started at 10. <laughs> and uh, when we got around to the third set, every once in a while, Jake, who had a, a sharp sense of humor, would start playing. On one and three instead of two and four, <laughs> and it made some uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Instead of sight reading, you were sight playing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> what What finally prompted you to consider leaving that life and entering? what would was very early jazz academia right 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 you are i wanted to raise a family i mean uh, i'm i am the boy who came from academia in the first place i never left academia so that in a sense uh, was always comfortable for me i was always um i love people Period. I wanted to raise a family and uh, make a living as a jazz trombone player. And thanks to Lonesome Old Town, I had a reputation all over the world. And I, I, that was, I never got a good degree myself, much to the discernment of my father. <laughs> but uh, I did get some honorary degrees a little later in life. So yes. that, that made a, the old man and I ended up good friends. So, so uh, I have a wonderful family, though. Uh, I think one of the most important things anybody could have is a family, a loving family, too. And uh, my wife, Pat, is uh, a pianist from Indiana. And um, I had to go through a divorce to get to some really somebody I could live with, and we've been married. We'll be married. Uh, we were married <laughs> uh, uh, 55 years. Congratulations. And, yeah, yeah. And you could see you just married, met my daughter. Yes. Who's now 52, and she has seen us through the pandemic. And uh, uh, you just don't have daughters like that, you know. She's always a, 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 um, a, what do you call it, archivist. And she's one hell of an archivist. And uh, my the, atmosphere, daughter, my the atmosphere at, at Berkeley um, more like a family? Were, were you, 
I'm trying to phrase, get this idea about the academic level. Was it less about testing and goals than it was about just learning to, to play gigs? You know, what made Berkeley to me was the humanity of the faculty in 1965, 66, actually, that go back to 55. I, I go back a whole lot more years at that. But when I went to the New England Conservatory in 1955, jazz was a dirty word. It was, uh, the, it was the popular department. And there were a few of us, like Roger Calloway, the great pianist, and Freddie Booter, percussionist with a, a pop, a great drummer, myself, and a few others, Al Bacon, um, were into jazz, and we were just not interested in going immediately into the symphony. That's That was their thing. If you were going headed for the symphony, you were in the right place. But if you were a jazzer, you were in the wrong place at that time. It has changed, so please forgive me. Um, it has it just, it's turned out to be just a fine top of the line school that it should have always been, as far as I'm concerned. But now, here comes uh, that faculty member down at 284 Newbury Street, it's a brown house. It's the Berkeley School of Music, and there's no degree given out. You could get a diploma. And uh, all of a sudden, you have teachers like uh, Lenny Johnson. Lenny Johnson is a lead trumpet player uh, you probably never heard of. But uh, when uh, uh, Pat Anderson got, uh, shall we say, uh, took a, a vacation to uh, get his head back together. Uh, Lenny Johnson went out and covered for him for six weeks. And this was a regular happening over and over. That, was, it's a, that in itself was a family. And he, Lenny taught Bill Chase and myself uh, at Berkeley in 1955. Now, I was supposedly at New England, but 10 blocks away was this Berkeley School of Music I wasn't allowed to go to because it didn't have a degree. My father, being an academic in the Ivy League, you know, said, no degree, you can't go there. So uh, I, 10 blocks away, though, was the Berkeley School of Music. And that's really where I was, because they always needed trombone players, because it was like a factory for big bands, you know, they were all over the place. And uh, so uh, Chase and I learned to lock in on each other. As a lead player, I'd be playing lead trombone. He'd be playing lead trumpet beautifully, just, you know, and he played lead trumpet beautifully, largely because of Lenny Johnson's influence. Uh, Basie's band had the same same thing. He would go play at with lead with Basie's band. And I played with Lenny at all of the Italian clubs around Boston. And, you know, the, the big Sinatra would come in and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, uh, boy, what we learned off Lenny, and he, he was a, a simple man who was extremely talented. God, he also went and played uh, lead for Quincy Jones in that first Quincy Jones band that went over overseas with uh, Sarah. Oh, the, the free oh. and free and easy band. Yeah. Yeah. I bet I have. I know I have a picture of that. I'll have to look. Yeah. Well, that had to. Uh, I'll get some names wrong here. But that trumpet section, they tell me, was uh, Clark Terry was there. Terry, Benny Bailey, Lenny Johnson, and Larry, another lead player. I think his name, first name was Larry. He was awesome. And then uh, Floyd Stanover, my dear friend. <laughs> 
Floyd Stanover, you've never heard of. He was no. a, another educator out of uh, Olympia, Washington. Uh, that's where he rape was raised. And he was with the Quincy Jones's band. And here's Clark and Benny and Lenny and X, I can't forget him, come up with the name. And, and Floyd Stanover. And none of these guys knew Floyd Stanover. He said he had one solo a night. It was on the bridge of uh, uh, Cherokee. And, and he said it took him eight bars to get down to the microphone and eight bars. <laughs> <laughs> the things you don't learn in school. Right. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, when you started there, did you have free reign to establish uh, a a teaching method, a, your own pedagogy, whatever it was, was it up to you to decide? Yes. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> well, I think that's the best different. Said, uh, that's the best a person, you know, a young person could hope for is to, to, to land with the person who just got off the road and who knew what the life was like and what was needed from musicians. Mm -hmm. Teaching is a two-way street. Teaching is a two-way street. Teaching, you know? Okay. Guy comes into your office and you say, well, let's play a tune. And you know pretty much where he's at within about 30 seconds. And uh, you can recognize a budding talent at all levels. I mean, the level is huge, you know. So uh, once you, I mean, there's the one who has had the, a musical bone in his or her body, but there are those, and you kind of gently try to aim them in another direction. Then you have Makoto Ozone and Curl Gerstein <laughs> coming in at the age of 12. And you go, oh, my God, is that unbelievable. And then you try to create an environment to have that person um, nurture his or her talent. And that's what I did with uh, Makoto Ozone, who came in when he was 20. Uh, from uh, on the airplane from Japan, uh, knowing 50 English words um, and ha having a ticket for this first night in Boston at the Holiday Inn in Cambridge, which is about two miles from the airport. This was at late at night. And the cab driver took him 45 miles away to another Holiday Inn in Northridge. Yeah, and left him there. Well, I mean, you, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. I, you know. So uh, the manager at the Holiday Inn in Northbridge recognized what had happened. Here's a guy who barely has no English, or 50 words is what he used to say. And uh, he, there was a room which had a broken key or something like that. And they let, let him stay free in that room overnight. And then they arranged some sort of a a ride back to Berkeley. Son of a bitch, right? Yeah. No, sorry. Have you had um, experiences as time went on when some students might have come from really well-established jazz programs in high school, or perhaps they had advanced yeah. teachers, and they would come to you and ask you about techniques or theory that was either foreign to you or that you didn't necessarily believe in. 
Yeah. But they wanted to know about it. Well, um, I would answer them with an inquiry if I had never heard of the that approach. I would ask to have the student explain what was involved. And I was trying to think of an example of that. And I suppose it wasn't Remington. Remington was a great teacher. Um, no, no, no. Um, but Philadelphia. Um, damn. Uh, there was a, a. I'll come up with it. Just almost, <laughs> I almost got it. <laughs> um, there was a teacher in Philadelphia who taught the call it. Damn it! It was a, what the. You have a mouthpiece like this. You put it in your face, and he, he would look for, are you an upstream or are you a downstream? If you were an upstream, that means when you went, as is in playing, the, up, the stream of air would come out of your horn and go upward and hit the, the top of the mouthpiece. And then there was the downstreamer. And um, I was the downstreamer. Remy, it wasn't Remington, damn it. I almost got the name. And uh, the pivot system, that's it. Uh, if you could look up the, the word pivot system, you'd have this guy's name. And there was a lot of, around the 70s, yeah, 70s, he was very popular. And there was a lot of people who were, you know, who believed that when you took the mouthpiece, you should put it up on your face and find what where it fits comfortably and live with it. And this guy had people moving it around a little like this, and he made it kind of a science. It was his thing, and that's how I'm going. And I actually had him come up and do a lecture for us, uh, of which he was like a W.C. Fields type, and he loved to be on stage and with a cigar, you know, the whole time. He was on, this is, we, of course, you, Berkeley was amazing. At one point, in 1980, we had 80 trombone students. Now, uh, if, if, that's unbelievable, but yeah. that was the high point. Uh, it's now somewhere around the uh, 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 twenty to thirty in that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the if, way one it your, if one of your better students came to you, let's say they they'd done two years uh, of a four year degree, and they said, "I got an offer to go with with Buddy Rich," what would you tell them? Oh. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. Yeah, that's the real thing. You know. I imagine you've had those students and your or your your colleagues did also, and some of them came back to finish and some of them didn't. Right. Well, they went on to brighter days, maybe, and then in an area that uh, they were working on. I mean, there aren't, there aren't many uh, Makoto's in this world, um, but there are a lot of people who have really good talents, fun to listen to, but the act isn't complete. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, it just for for one reason or another, it just maybe the individual wasn't 
that much into it are willing to deal with the realities of life as a traveling performer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or don't sometimes they don't have the the uh, skills to um, play shows and things like that. So there's you know you 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 uh, you try to steer again the two way street. Teaching's a two way street, and as long hey. as you've got that two way street going, you've got the world right there. Yeah. I wanted to show you. Um, I came across a program of a local high school band. This is in central New York, the Whitesboro Jazz Ensemble, a concert, July 15th, 1969. And the first piece on it, Mercy, 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 Joe Zavinul, arranged by P. Wilson. Ta -da. Ta -da -ta -da. <laughs> that, that was, you know, that was like uh, a hot chart and still is, of course. And I remember playing it. And I was a, and still I'm a huge Cannonball Adderley fan. So when it got to that part in in the in your arrangement where it abruptly changed keys, I was like, "Whoa, what was that?" That was my first rock chart, and I'm sitting there. Buddy, had, Buddy really wanted to do that. That was it was his his doing. Cannonball had the uh, had that album, the um, single rather, and it, it was kind of like a, a, a church scene, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was real nice. And uh, I, he said, he, I, he said that's that's the only I wrote three in one week, which is for me unheard of. Well, this is Buddy Rich, and he's at playing at M Lenny Stone the Turnpike. He's going to be there for one week. I better take advantage of the moment and come up with something. So I wrote Chelsea Bridge for him, and I wrote um, Mr. Lucky. Who do ba do da? Remember that from an old uh, TV show. And I wrote uh, Mercy, Mercy. And the Chelsea Bridge, that's right. Lush Life. And uh, Mercy. And the last one, I, I just, I wasn't used, actually, I wasn't used to the straight eighth notes at the time. And writing all those damn things out, which takes some time. And so, uh, Bow do, bow do, do, bow do, 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 you know, and then there's that celebratory kind of sound, you know, da, 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 but why did you change keys? Just boredom. because you could? Yes, boredom. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm yeah. going, you know, this is all, this is going to be like four minutes in the key of B flat. See, get a little fuss, but just move it up to D flat there for a minute. And then we, we, we kind of built it. Oh, do, do, da, da, da. Which is like that's uh, from uh, my uh, my fair lady. Yeah, home again. Yeah, I love it. W were you there? Uh, when they first read it, were you I present? sure was. Mm -hmm. At the end of the week, they do the Sunday afternoon show. You know that means they they'll play one set at two, and uh, I brought all the charts out. It was cold. It was uh, one of those winter days, 
I had a long scarf around me and all that sort of thing. And I knew I better have Mercy done. That's the only one that really mattered to him at that point. And uh, the place, is Lenny's on the turnpike, Route 1. And, uh, I guess uh, that would be uh, Topsfield. And uh, I walked into the door. The band is right here, all playing. And he's on the, over near the, the far, over near the, the wall over there. And he just, you can see me coming into the door. The door's right there. Place is standing room only. I mean, it is packed. Sunday session, right? And he yelled over. You got mercy? <laughs> I said, yeah. Pass it out. And he passed it out. Yep. And I said, you got to be careful. Of, there's a drum break for you that is one bar longer than you think. So you're going to have to think about that. And then two, three, four. Bang, boo, doo. Now you gotta remember, I I got many of those guys like Richie Cole and you know, they they were all um, friends of mine and had been with me with the Dues band. So I got them on the band in the first place. So they knew me and there was no problem there. And um also I like Buddy Rich. Buddy and I were friends. And uh, um, ever I guess my time sense is is Buddy Rich's time sense, and it goes back to that stupid <laughs> drum set that I had as a as a ten year old playing to Buddy Rich of all things, Opus Number One, Sunny Side of the Street, all those things that he did for uh, Tommy. The time feel was all Buddy, and that always has been with me. It still is. Makoto used to say to me. He said, you know why we play what do so well together? And I said, oh. I looked over him and I said, yes, I do. And he looked at me and we both said together, Buddy Rich. We we locked in. You know, back with Makoto and I toured around for about three years uh, because of that record we made. And uh, What was the reaction to the first reading of Mercy, Mercy at Money's on the Turnpike? Standing ovation. They stood for that, huh? Yeah. I, it, I'm sitting there. I, I'm i sitting there going, I'll be damned. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Well, <laughs> I've actually got a, a picture of me rehearsing his band. I, of course, I loved it. I mean, that's that's what I that's where I live. Yeah. The, well, we've been at this for about an hour. I I've got a couple more questions. Um, this one, I don't know if this is bad interviewing style, but I know the answer to this. But I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> okay. Are you familiar with the Billy May recording, sort of Dixie? Yes, I love it especially South Rampart Street Parade. That son of a bitch is an absolute genius. The, the, the dance, you know, it's the march. Da, da, do, 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 right? And he's, he's, I don't know, this is high fidelity. We're not in stereo yet. It, Stereo did not exist when he recorded that. That is, a, that is, the state of the art was high fidelity. You remember that? And he wrote that song, so when you play it, you can actually feel the parade going by you and continuing down the street. He was, how did he pull that off? Oh. I sometimes wonder how the um, 
that's a beautiful have, have the musicians got through it without sort of cracking up sometimes i mean it sounds like spike jones meets solder finnegan or something absolutely spike jones was i i believe it or not my nickname at phillips exeter was spike and it was because of spike jones i had every spike jones record in the, in the ever oh man i mean I even had a Spike Jones band with it, and I borrowed the the pistol from the the uh, the, the uh, athletic department. The athletic. You, know, <laughs> you know, da 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 You all was hurt. I know one. <laughs> Those guys could play, though, man. Oh, could they ever? I saw every Spike Jones said if there were two if there were two musicians I would be there at some point if they were in, within two hundred miles of me. There, those two are Louis Armstrong, and the other was Spike Jones. I got I went to every year he would come and pack Symphony Hall, which holds four thousand five hundred people. Two shows a day, and it was the funniest stuff you ever heard. The, you know, things that I learned from Spike Jones is, as you said, those guys were some of the best musicians in the world. George Rock, the trumpet player, and I can't remember that drummer, but the drummer was phenomenal. But they all were, were amazing. And the timing of all of the noises, the grunts and all, you know what I mean? It was dead on. It never missed. It was like listening to Buddy Rich. Yeah. It 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 came off as spontaneous, but uh yeah. was not. Was really hmm. ranged. What do you think? Um do you have an opinion? If you observe what has happened to jazz education and its growth, I'm not sure I have a question here, but I, I'm amazed at the level that jazz education has risen to, yet there seems to be a disconnect with record sales and just making a living as a jazz musician. I agree. You know, so the music is getting so fast. It, it reflects the society we live in today. I mean, you pick up, you can do everything instantly rather than develop a, an emotion. If people don't have time. They don't want to wait for the, the, the story and the conclusion. They just want to hear the conclusions. Oh my God. And uh, that really annoys me. And no wonder the sales are down. It's not communicating. It's uh, it, too many of these guys are playing the exercises. You know what I mean? I bet I can play giant steps faster than you. <laughs> they play, play it faster than me. <laughs> You know, that's kind of stuff. And that just pisses me off, but really. Yeah, and I, my observation is, especially with um, the rhythm section players, is many people seem to be unsatisfied with just a company. It's almost like everybody's soloing at the same time. Absolutely. They are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're we're showing our our age and uh, yes. <laughs> our listening habits. Yes. <laughs> See, I I read uh, all the information on you, and I heard we were going to be doing this. And your career actually is interesting because, boy, you're everywhere. You know, in composition, classical, so called. It's, uh, it's all music, as far as I'm concerned. Period, right? Yeah, I know. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, this is just this has been marvelous. I I know we could go on for a couple more hours, and may, maybe we'll look down the road for you know, part two. But my pleasure. Yeah, I I appreciate all your 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 humor and and mixed with wisdom. And uh, and I understand that your your daughter was named after Marion McPartland. Is that correct? Yes, that is. And you spent some time with her. A lot together. We were we were really very close. Yeah. She she came and I invited her to play with my high school band at the time. And boy, that is one classy person. Right. Yeah. That's why we were friends. You know. <laughs> you travel in good company. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Mr. Wilson, thank you again for your time. Um, I'll I'll pause the recording and we'll. We'll say our, we'll have a coda. Good. Okay.